Hi, my name's John, uh, John Quirk. Um, so I was an undergrad science degree, um, similar to Gina. I, I went to ROTC, I had ROTC scholarship uh, undergrad. And then after that, I did four years as an army officer, as a, as a combat engineer. Um, I went to Iraq in 2004, and then in 2006, I started working on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Um, so for those of you who aren't super familiar with Congress, it is one of many committees. It's about 27, well, 27 members, um, roughly equally divided, uh, Republican, Democrat. The exact ratio depends on how many seats are held in Congress by each party. Uh, and so it is a very bipartisan committee. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, lack of bipartisanship in, in politics today, but but I will say the, the SASC or Senate Armed Services Committee is this great sweet spot of bipartisanship on the Hill. Um, we demonstrate that by passing a bill every single year for the last uh, 63 years in a row. And so that's the NDAA or National Defense Authorization Act. And that is a bill that um, uh, authorizes everything the Department of Defense does um, from how much money they get for pay, uh, how many tanks, how many aircraft, et cetera. Uh, it also enacts several uh, policy-driven provisions, which is the areas that I kind of focus on. And so I am on uh, the readiness subcommittee. And so some of those areas include um, the uh, energy, environmental, and climate policies for the Department of Defense. Uh, we also cover things like EVs, uh, rare earth elements. And so those are kind of the topics we'll get into today, um, is in, in addition to some other policy, um, things like uh, burn pit policy, um, cluster munitions uh, and, and the decision by the administration to ship that over to Ukraine uh, very recently. Um, so, and then from there, we can kind of go into whatever topics uh, you guys want to have. Um, the intent um, is to go over this in a real kind of conversational way. So I'm going to talk about a topic, kind of break and see if there's any Q&A. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any time too. I don't have a ton of slides because I'm not trying to bore you guys with, with slide, uh, you know, slide PowerPoint. But um, so that's me in a nutshell. Uh, and so with that, we'll just kind of get rolling. So I, I kind of touched on it, but the Department of Defense, DOD, is the largest energy user in the federal government, right? And so closely behind them is the U.S. Postal Service, uh, but it is very much in the department's interest to operate as efficiently as possible. And so that is especially important in a conflict. So um, looking at combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last uh, 20 years, roughly half of service members killed in action or wounded uh, were connected to roadside bombs on logistical resupply convoys. And so when I was in Iraq in 2004, we lost soldiers, and, and that always stays with you. And so um, part, of, part of those resupply convoys, roughly 80% of, of the convoys themselves are just committed to fuel and water alone. So that is a significant amount of resources just putting into pushing and pulling water and fuel around uh, the theater, bottled water mostly. Um, and so when you look at military aircraft, right, the, the vast majority of them are powered by gas turbine engines. And just from a, an efficiency perspective, about 75% of the energy in a gas turbine engine is just exhausted as waste, waste heat. Uh, and that extends to internal combustion engines like you see on most cars in the road every day. And about 40% or so of that energy of the fuel that you buy just gets burned and, and emitted as waste heat. So there is a huge opportunity um, to make those kinds of engines more efficient, whether we're talking about aircraft, uh, ground vehicles, or ships. Um, and it's also a lot of money. So DOD spends roughly $15 billion each year on energy costs alone. Uh, the vast majority of what is called operational energy or the energy to, to move, train, and sustain military forces and weapons platforms for military operations. So that includes everything from your tactical power systems, uh, your generators, your weapons platforms. And when you talk about um, where the military might be involved in the next conflict, whether that's um, in the Pacific theater and in, in some kind of involvement with China or North Korea, or what you're seeing in Ukraine with Russia, um, when you're talking about um, reducing your logistical vulnerabilities, so your energy use as much as possible, that's really in the interest of warfighters. So it is It is not just saving lives, it is becoming uh, more efficient in your day-to-day -day operations. It's saving money, because we're talking billions of dollars here. And at the end of the day, um, if you can become more efficient, you can also reduce your carbon footprint. And so we'll get into some of those topics a little bit later. Um, but the operational energy is about 75% of what um, DOD uses every year in energy costs alone. So it, it's a lot. And so if I can kind of summarize where if you're a warfighter, if you're a member of the military, 
um, the the real goal there is to have more fight, less fuel. That's kind of the the succinct takeaway, if I could kind of put it in that, on a button. Um, and so, power generation and energy delivery are critical to war fighting, and that's been the case throughout history. You know, the saying goes: tactics wins battles, logistics wins wars. Um, and so there are a number of ways that the Department of Defense is trying to reduce demand through energy efficiency today. Um, it can be as simple as using more efficient generators. So when, when I was in Iraq, you know, you're living in kind of a tent city or a Ford operating base or a FOB as they call it. Um, everything that you use on the ground is usually driven, driven by a generator. And so that takes fuel. Um, it's running usually 24 seven, whether you need that power or not. And so it is burning up that fuel at a rate that's not sustainable. Uh, and then requires more and more logistical resupply convoys, which we talked about. And that really just exposes um, service members to, to roadside bombs, which we're trying to mitigate as much as possible. So you can do things like tying them into a microgrid to optimize use and reduce that fuel demand. Um, you can use uh, solar panels, which the department is doing with more and more frequency. Uh, you have a small solar array to sort of power your tent cities. Uh, you can have a small packable roller, uh, roll-up solar panel to recharge your radio batteries when you're out on patrol or on a mission. You can um, find more efficient tents with greater insulation value. You can reclaim and reuse water for showers to ensure proper hygiene. Um, and you can switch from old light bulbs to LEDs. Uh, and what's, what's kind of interesting is, I mean, LEDs are probably more and more common um, than what in, what's what you all are used to. Um, you know, when I when I grew up, it was more like incandescent bulbs. Uh, and what's crazy about them is, I mean, 90% uh, of the wattage of the energy you pay for in an old light bulb um, was emitted in a non-visible spectrum of light, so infrared light, right? And that is completely useless for, for lighting purposes other than warmth, which is why old light bulbs got so hot. And so what LEDs do is they take all that energy you want and need it and put it into a visible spectrum of light. And so you don't need, you know, 60 to 100 watts to do that. You really only need 3 to 10 watts. So you're not only using less energy, you're also cooler to the touch compared to what you're using. And so when you add that up over time, um, you know, one LED light bulb in every house today has the equivalent of saving about 800,000 cars uh, off the road. So when you're talking about not just efficiency, you can extend that to reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions on the back end too, which is, I think, something most people are in favor for. So beyond, you know, combining all these technologies, it also provides a significant combat capability for the military. Um, and so in one case in Afghanistan, there was a Marine Corps forward operating base that combined all of these different technologies, and they were able to operate um, off, completely off the grid without frequent energy resupply for months at a time. And so that is a real um, bonus um, to, to service members, especially when, you know, they're, they're in harm's way. And so not only does it help service members, but the military is all often frequently called upon to do humanitarian crisis or what they call HADR or humanitarian assistance disaster relief. So in the event of response of a hurricane, when you're talking to the National Guard um, or really any anywhere around the world, these technologies can play a significant role in enabling the military to do their job better, but also help the people that they're going to assist. And so back in 2014, uh, there was an Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and the Army used these forward operating base technologies, or FOB in a box, and they used those setups to help provide humanitarian assistance in Africa, and it really enabled um, them to do not just their job, but do it more efficiently and, uh, and effectively. And so you can you, you see these types of technologies extend to other areas in DoD, too. So one of the things that uh, the Navy is looking at is hybrid electric drives uh, in their ships, in their surface ships. So it is essentially a Prius capability for a Navy ship. And so they can provide about 33% fuel savings. Uh, and why that's important is there are some ships that, um, you know, their job is to like a ballistic, ballistic missile defense uh, ship. Uh, let's say it's operating in the Mediterranean Sea and it's, and it's assigned a box that it has to constantly patrol and be there to provide missile support. And so you're just constantly burning fuel um, if you can kick on a hybrid electric drive, uh, similar to the way a Prius shuts off at a, at a you know, a, at a stoplight, um, the Navy can then use that electric battery rather than burn fuel. They can operate more efficient, more efficiently. And then the, that is less time they need to then come out of that box and, and pull up to another ship to refuel. So that's more time on station, as, as the Navy likes to call it. But really, it's just at the end of the day, a more efficient way to operate. Um, 
when you look at the Air Force, uh, if you had to guess how much of uh, the Air Force's energy use, about 60% of it is not jet fighters. Uh, it's actually just tankers, uh, transport planes, and bombers, not, not your typical fighters or something you'd see on Top Gun. So um, what the Air Force is doing is they're looking at using a blended wing body. So typically what you would fly on a plane today, you know, they call it like a tube wing fuselage setup. And so having a blended wing body, which is more of like a flying V shape, um, is far more efficient. It can be uh, roughly 30% efficient. So 30% may not sound like a lot, but again, when you're talking about $15 billion of energy cost every year, 30% is, is pretty significant. Um, and it's not just a, a energy savings when you're talking about where the Air Force operates, how long distance they fly, um, whether or not they may be involved in a, in a conflict in the future in the Pacific. I mean, these are significant distances. It's about, I want to say, 4,000 miles between Hawaii and Guam alone. Um, and so using things like blended wing body, you can um, take off and land on shorter runways, uh, which might be more important if you're operating in kind of um, more disparate, um, uh, faraway islands in the Pacific. Uh, and, you know, in a conflict, that's really going to matter. You're, you're not having to fly as many tankers then. That reduces the number of targets on the battlefield or aircraft in the sky. Uh, what's cool about this, too, is it's a joint program with NASA. So major airliners are also becoming interested. So FedEx, uh, Delta, and other major airline uh, companies right now, fuel costs are, are driving them crazy. And so when, you, when they're looking at what's the next step in terms of commercial aircraft, um, where the military starts, and like a lot of different technologies, everything from, you know, satellites to the GPS in your phone, that usually... The, those initial R&D efforts started in the DoD space and then were applied to uh, civilian technologies too. Uh, and there are some other kind of promising fields that are that I think need more development but are coming along. So sustainable aviation fuel is one. Um, so these are some of the things uh, that the Air Force is looking at. They're also, you know, you're not having to do, um, you're not having to just purchase uh, new aircraft entirely. They're looking at some other sort of smaller target investments. So if you're doing things like using 3D printing to make winglets and more aerodynamic fins that you can attach to the fuselage. That'll reduce drag and reduce fuel burn. Um, even something as simple as like moving windshield wipers from a horizontal to a vertical location on some of these long range bombers can result in like two to 4% fuel savings. And so again, that may sound small, but when you're talking about a $15 billion expense every year, it's, it's no joke. Um, another area that the Army's using and the Marines are looking at on the ground side is uh, their next, uh, so the, the vehicle that's going to replace the Humvee is called the JLTV, or Joint Lake Tactical Vehicle. And it, again, has a Prius uh, battery setup. So it has an idle kit that shuts the engine off when not in use. And so having that lithium ion battery is not just good for fuel savings, it reduces noise, uh, which is particularly important on a battlefield. It provides you recharging of electronics and radios and phones. Um, it require, or it, it benefits in a uh, lower heat signature for vehicles, which is important because we've kind of moved beyond night vision uh, and infrared um, sensing and optics are, are becoming more and more prevalent on the battlefield today. And so the Army and the Marines are very interested in this kind of silent overwatch capability. Um, Special Operations Forces use electric motorcycles for recon missions in Afghanistan. And so why would you want to use them? I mean, having that electric capability provides more torque and speed to get out of trouble. Um, I don't know if you've, have many of you taken a ride in, in an EV, but the acceleration when you want it is instant versus a uh, combustion engine um, because the electric motor can deliver that torque on demand. And so it kind of takes a second for a combustion engine to kick in. Again, you can operate silently and, uh, uh, you know, louder and slower is generally a bad tactical outcome on the battlefield. So th th is one of the many reasons why um, special operators are using it too. Uh, Navy SEALs use small electric submarines that detach from larger uh, nuclear-powered submarines. And so um, it, it's an area that I think is it's constantly improving. It, you know, the, the military is always finding ways to try to be more efficient um, to improve their combat capabilities. And we're starting to see new technologies uh, emerging. So electric aviation, there are things like, uh, you know, Joby is a company in California that does some taxis. Uh, you know, Amazon, you've probably seen as testing drones for delivery. Uh, they're being used to do search and rescue. Um, even simple as things as like observing sharks uh, over the waters of New Jersey right now, because there's a spike in shark attacks. Uh, drones um, are also being used to plant trees in remote areas. Uh, it's a little bit more, uh, excuse me, 
to be more efficient. Um, so last year's NDAA uh, required all non-tactical vehicles to be electric by 2035. So um, in addition to all of the tactical stuff that we've talked about, DOD also just uses right, a number of non-tactical, so vans, sedans, buses, um, and it's about 180,000 vehicles per year. And so, again, you're talking about um, ways in which the department can save costs by switching to EVs. Uh, they are, the way they do it is they lease them, so they're not just, you know, going out and buying a Tesla, because certainly that would cost more upfront than like a, a gas-powered sedan. Um, but for the military, it can provide another kind of capability. So they have what's called a vehicle to grid capability. So you can use that EV battery to also power uh, during the day. So you can reduce um, peak hours. So at you know during certain times of the day, uh, your utility rate goes up and down depending on use. So using that EV to reduce some of those peak shavings and provide more power, um, you can use it to provide power in the event of a targeted cyber attack to the grid or a natural disaster that are becoming more frequent because of climate change. So um, at the end of the day, fuel efficiency equals mission effectiveness for the military. And it's really about combat capability, but you can also see some of those costs. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're also reducing greenhouse gas emissions on the back end, which again is not the military's job, but it is an added bonus. And throughout history for the military, at least, energy is how we win or lose wars uh, when you really kind of pull back the curtain. Um, so on the operational energy side piece there, I'll stop talking and see if anybody has any questions on this one before we kind of move on to some other energy issues. There, are, sorry, Gina and Sienna, I don't know if you see in the Q&A, there are, if you see the Q&A feature at the bottom, there are some questions there if you want to ask them. Okay. Okay, all right. So we have a question from uh, Thomas Harbour. Um, he is saying, are we learning any lessons from the Ukraine conflict that help reinforce the push for transition to more sustainable or renewable energy technology? Yeah, great question. Um, so I would say, yes. Um, you know, the, I, I think before the Ukraine conflict started, a lot of people thought the Russian forces were far more formidable than what played out on the battlefield. And when you poke at the reasons why. There are a number of them, but one of the biggest drivers was logistics and failure to deliver logistics. And so a lot of that came in the form of not being able to push fuel and energy forward, which again is something that we really talked about um, and, and was a real vulnerability in Iraq and Afghanistan, but that also played out in Ukraine. Um, and so right now, I think the Ukrainian forces, and, and we'll get into that when we talk about cluster munitions a little bit later, but right now, the focus on Ukraine is really um, staying toe to toe with with the Russian um, attack and, and, and pushing for their counterattack. So I think it certainly applies, um, but I think there, there there's certainly an opportunity there. But they are, I think, more focused on, hey, can we have more weapons right now to make sure we're not being overrun and, and pushed back? Um, let's see. And then there's another one about uh, changing a light bulb. How big a positive change can happen when the Department of Defense makes a similar switch across the force? Yeah, I mean, so um, again, providing using more efficient technologies um, can save the department energy use, which is important when you're forward, uh, like somewhere in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it also matters here at home. Um, you know, reducing energy costs is always something that can be done because, again, the military just spends a lot of money, and so you want to have um, you want to be as efficient as possible. You want to um, you know, reduce your expenditure of taxpayer funds as much as you possibly can. And so the, the military, I think, is, is always looking for ways to become more agile and, and nimble. So um, Robert Bernstein said, there's a point of view that climate change will be a major issue in future military operations. Is this something of concern or is it not a concern? Yeah, um, so that's an area we're going to talk about very shortly. So I want to hold that question um, as we get to that one. If that's okay. Okay. But we'll and get we'll, we'll we'll get all into climate change. Don't worry. All right. Thank you. Uh, there's an anonymous person, and they said, "You mentioned that 60% of the air force energy is things like bombers slash transport planes. Is there anything we are actively doing to make the other 40% more energy efficient?" 
Yeah, so there's a R&D program uh, called ATEP. So it is a more uh, is an adaptive um, jet turbine engine that the Air Force is looking at uh, to power its fighter aircraft. And so uh, they are looking at a, a version of the engine that is far more efficient than what's currently being used today. Uh, the tricky part is because of just the way of fighter aircraft, the way they operate uh, and a lot of its pilot behavior, um, they like to fly fast and, and, and that just burns up more fuel sometimes. And so it is it is part technology, which is what the Air Force is trying to tackle with uh, with uh, that type of engine. Um, but there's also a, a cultural change um, aspect to that that's that's tricky to surmount. But but yes, it is being looked at. And then we have another question from Thomas Harper. He's saying um, arguments against this sort of transition often hinge on threats to safety of troops in combat environments. As someone with experience in Iraq, would you have welcomed this sort of technology during your service no, in forward sorry, operations? My question. My question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, you know, when we were there, we were um, in very inefficient tents, generators were running all the time. Um, you know, th there are some uh, quality of life problems with it. You're always breathing in generator smoke. Um, you're hot and uncomfortable uh, in, a, in, a, in what's already a dangerous austere environment. So um, having more efficiencies, I think, would have been really welcome. Um, you know, there are there are still some gaps to fill, right? So we can't switch to EVs uh, across tactical vehicles today, but there are investments being made in the industrial and commercial sector right now to go in that direction. So I, I absolutely would have welcomed those things. Um, you know, anytime you can be more efficient and use less fuel, again, that's, you know, that's less fuel resupply convoys on the road and less chances of being exposed to roadside bombs, uh, which are, are just very, very difficult um, to deal with in a lot of ways. So yeah, I would have absolutely welcomed that. Um, I'm going to, we have a question from someone who's raised their hand. Um, Payman, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Quirk, I have a question. So, uh, in a battlefield where there uh, were, as you know, as you as you've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, the infrastructure isn't so great. You know, uh, it could be cause of the current war or the war that uh, it followed. So, how would DoD keep its cars and vehicles fully charged and operational when there isn't any infrastructure for that? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, so again, it, it's so that would be tactical vehicles only. And so right now, you know, there are a very number of small tactical vehicles that are that are fully electric. So some of the ones that I talked about. So uh, things like um, you know, electric motorcycle. Uh, you can have mobile power sources, so you don't need significant batteries, um, batteries of significant size uh, to power those kinds of of, of equipment. Um, but if you're talking about like an electric Humvee or an electric JLTV, I mean, that would require significant capabilities, right? So uh, one of the things the department is looking at uh, is a way to uh, tackle that is a, is a thing called Project Pele, which is a, a small mobile nuclear reactor um, that would be uh, that would provide a, a significant capability and a significant amount of energy density to power a forward operating base in addition to electric vehicles. And so you're talking about something between one and five megawatts of power, which is significant. So, um, you know, I, I have an EV here at home and, and the energy demand is the equivalent of running your dryer machine, you know, the entire time you're charging, right? So that amounts to about five or six hours of charging um, once a week. And so it is a 50 amp breaker on your, on your circuit breaker. Um, so it's not a it's not a significant amount of power, but it's not insignificant either. So I, I take your point. It's something that has to be addressed, um, and hopefully will be worked out over time with better R and D, and we'll see how you know Project Pele plays out. Okay, more questions okay. from the chat. Um, Douglas Tonjes is saying, "What is happening in Congress Committee to reduce actually going to war?" Yeah, um, so there, so there's something called the Authorization of Military Force, uh, which was enacted and passed by Congress shortly after 9/11, uh, uh, which uh, you know under previous administrations was a pretty broad authority for the military to conduct combat operations across the, across the globe. Um, very recently in Congress, it was passed to um, reduce or not, excuse me, revoke that authorization. 
Um, so there's no longer blanket authority for those kinds of operations. And um, it's something that was a bipartisan effort. Uh, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia was a big proponent behind that. And so there, there are certainly efforts underway to try and reduce those opportunities. Um, but it is a it is it is something that is uh, that is always a challenge. And we have another question. And excuse me if I say this wrong, but That's it's okay. from Halak Chawla, and uh, it says, "What are some of the major factors that currently stand in the way of progress slash improving energy efficiency?" Yeah, um, I mean there there is a lot of. Um, I think there's a there's a mental cultural aspect to it. You know, a lot of people are concerned about the range of EVs. Um, there is a certainly there is a large push by the fossil fuel industry to keep doing business as usual for them. Uh, they obviously have a vest, vested interest as, as being the most you know profitable business on the planet to keep doing that. So there are some industry uh, inertia that has to be overcome. Um, uh, so yeah, those are those are two big factors that jump out. Um, okay. Right. So I got one from Troy Sonier, I think. Um, how is the department changing training training doctrine in regard to the introduction of the energy efficient battlefield? Yeah. So training doctrine is a really important piece because you have to have um, total familiarity and comfort levels with using any new technology. And so um, providing um, training uh, at the starting of like basic basic officer uh, camps. Uh, basic training uh, when you when you're enlisted and you go off to your um, military specialty schools, have, making sure those technologies are there so you're familiar with them, you learn how to operate them. Um, you want to make sure they're tested and and given uh, all the stressors that you would see on the battlefield to make sure they work as as intended. Um, and so there are ways in which uh, you know the training needs to be evolved, but really having that familiarity uh, and that confidence is what's really important for service members when they go into harm's way. Uh, and so there are some other types of training uh, effects that can be done to operate more efficiently. So one of the things we did when we were in Iraq, um, I mean, obviously it was really, really hot. Uh, the, the way I would describe it is that when you open an oven and you feel that kind of dry blast of heat, that's often what it felt like going outside. And so, you know, it would be, you know, upwards of 110 degrees someday and you're wearing uh, body armor, you're wearing a helmet, you're wearing all your gear. Uh, it, you know, you're, it, it's just hot and really tough to do. So one of the things we did as an engineer, because we were, our job was to build things uh, and sometimes blow stuff up, is we operated at night. So we did a complete reverse cycle, um, uh, you know, training mode. So we were basically nocturnal. So we slept during the day, which took some getting used to, but then we operated at night um, because it was just cooler and, and just easier to operate. So those are the kind of training um, modifications that you, that, that, uh, you know, you have to adapt to. And then another question from Thomas Harper is, um, with NATO having ever increasing importance, does there seem to be a push amongst allies to jointly develop this sort of technology or work towards some sort of NATO standard that would help with future multinational operations? Yeah, so NATO is, is in, in some ways a little more forward leaning uh, than, than what you would think uh, for the US military. So uh, particularly the Brits and the French and the Germans are very, um, uh, climate minded. And so they are leaning into uh, more energy efficient. Um, they are looking at kind of a, what they view as a, as a net zero approach, uh, which is really hard to do uh, with the current technologies set up, but it is certainly the direction in which they are going. And as, um, you know, teammates as in as NATO allies, it's going to be important that we standardize what we do as much as possible. So you, uh, across a suite of military technologies, whether it's a NATO standard round of ammunition, uh, the F-35 aircraft is a joint strike fighter that NATO allies are using and purchasing. Um, so there, it, it is going to be increasingly important to make sure we're all on the same page. And, and a lot of NATO allies are really um, pretty forward leaning on, on finding um, energy efficiencies and tackling the climate crisis too. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. It says, how big is the impact of recession in the development of energy efficiency and renewable sources? Um, that's a good question. That's really kind of more of an economic question. But what I would say is, um, 
you know, when you look at some of the drivers of, of a recession, whether it be unemployment um, or inflation, uh, you know, a lot of um, recently passed legislation like the CHIPS Act, like the IRA, uh, offer significant uh, investments in the development of the domestic capability and a lot of the onshoring of energy efficient technologies, whether it's EV batteries in the auto industry, which you're seeing, uh, significant investments. I mean, we're talking, you know, billions of dollars um, across the U.S. Uh, in areas that have had um, some hard economic times. And so making sure that like in the, in the auto industry alone, right, from when you go from a combustion engine to an energy or an EV battery, um, it's going to be really important to make sure those factories, uh, those supply chains are set up in a way that um, provides the continuation of jobs um, that are done in a way that, um, you know, you're not breaking the bank on inflation so people can afford these kinds of things. And so you're seeing things like a $7,500 um, tax rebate for EVs, uh, which significantly drives down the costs. Um, and then a lot of that too is mindset, right? So, um, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar, but there, there are some studies that show, like if you have a, a, you know, a Toyota 4Runner SUV or a, um, you know, a Tesla Model Y, you're actually, even though the sticker price for the EV is far more, uh, you know, greater upfront, you're saving roughly eight to ten thousand dollars in life cycle costs compared to a, a combustion engine, um, because you have fewer parts, uh, you have fewer maintenance. You're not buying gas. You can charge when you want when your utility rates are lower. Um, you know EVs are far more safer on the road. Um, you know there are a number of benefits. Uh, you know both economic and personal. Okay, all good questions, by the way. And then we have another question from Payman. Um, how do you feel car companies asking taxpayers for funds to make EVs so, um, that will eventually be sold that, back to taxpayers? Um, that. How do I feel about car companies asking taxpayers for funds to make EVs more uh, eventually sold back to taxpayers? Um, I mean, personally, you know, I mean, car companies um, certainly need support. Um, I would say, you know, there are I mean, there are still billions of dollars of years and, and subsidies that go to fossil fuel companies every every year. Um, so I think having um, having a, a even level playing field for EVs to get started, I think is going to be important. So that's going to require investments. Um, are EVs going to be eventually sold back? I mean, it depends on it. I mean, there are a number of recycling um, capabilities and, and, and factories that are being set up across the country today. So um, you're not just, you, you could resell your EV, right? But you could also take that battery and recycle it. Um, it could be reclaimed and reprocessed and put into um, a new EV battery. So there's a, there's a guy who used to work for Tesla who started Redwood Materials in Nevada. Um, they have this massive uh, factory where they're recycling lithium ion batteries um, of all types, not just EVs. So like everything from, you know, your phones, uh, laptop batteries, and they are on schedule to produce about a million EV batteries that can be put into new cars uh, per year over the next couple of years here. So um, yeah, I, hopefully that answers the question. Um, we have another question from Robert Bernstein and it says, um, is there any reduction in combat effectiveness with a push to more energy efficient systems? Um, hmm. Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, you know, the 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 military again. It, it takes a long time for them to adopt any kind of new technology. So by the time it gets through that whole process, it is thoroughly tested, um, and and it is. Um, you know, they're they're not going to just adopt something and, and use it on a whim. Um, so I think by the time it gets through the uh, very long acquisition process of the Department of Defense, it is thoroughly, um, you know, kicked around in the dirt and making sure that it's actually going to operate when you need it. Um, and again, a lot of the um, a lot of the efficiencies are are true combat capabilities. You can it depends on how you want to lean on it, right? Like you could lean on, oh, this LED light um, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, but it, but the reality is, I mean, it it allows the military to operate more efficiently. Um, you know, it re they reduce heat, uh, they reduce costs, um, which is all something that you know whether you're in the military or not, you know, you can be supportive of, hopefully. All right, so Tina asks, how are EVs safer on the road than traditional vehicles? Um, so they are, uh, I mean, that's not just me saying it. it the, so the Department of Transportation, they do crash tests on every type of vehicle. 
Uh, and so today, um, Teslas are the uh, safest cars on the road. And uh, when you look at the top several, um, they're also the most American made uh, cars on the road, which is kind of a nice thing if you're into that. Um, so the, one of the reasons why they are safer uh, is they have a, uh, the battery is on basically the floor of the entire vehicle. So you, that center of gravity is lower. So you're less likely to roll over uh, in an accident compared to like an SUV. Um, they don't have a engine block up front. Um, there are two electric drive trains at the kind of the base of the wheel. So um, having that uh, frunk, you know, that where that where that engine block normally is uh, provides a greater crumple zone on impact. Um, they're genuinely built with stronger materials. So like the, the roof of some EVs uh, can withstand a lot of pressure. Um, and so, you know, when you're you're also less likely to break down because you're using fewer parts. Um, so you're looking at fewer maintenance issues, uh, which also goes out to safety. So uh, there, there are a number of ways that EVs are actually safer than the combustion engine. Hopefully that answers that. Um, an anonymous attendee also asked, could the government use solar power to power EVs and would that be energy efficient? Great question. They do uh, in small doses. So there are two different ways that they use solar power. So there are portable solar vehicle EV chargers that, that work right now. So it's kind of a, um, it would be like the size of a couple tables for a solar array. And so the army has a few of these that they can move around and, and charge EVs on the go, uh, which is a great capability. Um, again, using it just from a cost perspective, or like if you're in a natural disaster and you need to power that EV when the grid is down, uh, that's a great capability. Um, they're also, the department uses a lot of uh, solar energy um, through what are called power purchase agreements or energy savings performance contracts. And so this is something that not just the military is doing, uh, but Walmart is actually one of the biggest solar users um, beyond the, the companies you would think like Google and Amazon that are trying to buy more renewable energy. Uh, Walmart's doing it just from a business perspective. So uh, one of the interesting things about, you know, Walmart is a pretty conservative company, but when they had um, Hurricane Sandy in 2012, um, that those power outages wiped out, and they spoiled a lot of their a lot of their um, their food. So their frozen foods, their 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 meats, things that were temperature controlled, um, they decided, hey, look, we need that off the grid. You know, when the grid goes down, capability, and so rooftop solar, um, solar energy, um, more diverse sources, so not just relying on one type or the other. You know, it doesn't just have to be renewables, but becoming more resilient um, just made sense for Walmart from a business perspective alone. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can go ahead. Um, we have another question about EVs, but I know mm -hmm. that you have like more stuff you want to talk about. Yeah, I know. So we can talk about if, EVs the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. If you just let me know if like you want to stop the questions or you want to continue. But no, that's okay. One. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we have one from Megan. Um, are these EVs using lithium? And if so, won't extracting them such a, won't extracting such a large amount have a negative effect on the environment? Yeah. So um, most most batteries, uh, most EVs do use lithium. Um, uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, you know, it, it it certainly can have a very significant impact on the environment, um, particularly when you look at the old ways of strip mining. Uh, which began uh, in North Carolina. Um, so lithium, um, you know, started in, in, in North Carolina. And, and I'll just mention North Carolina because I know you guys, your next topic, um, or I think for next year maybe is nuclear power. Um, so the reason lithium kind of began in the U.S. was it, it plays a very key role in the triggering of a nuclear device. And so North Carolina was a big proponent uh, in production of lithium early on. But to answer your question more specifically, um, Yes. Uh, so there are a couple different batteries th that we use. So there's lithium iron phosphate, uh, which is a type of EV battery. Um, but a number of um, uh, EV companies, so there are two in China right now that are looking at sodium ion batteries, so no lithium at all. And so you can, you can use different materials. Um, some are more effective for energy density. Some are more effective for longer range. Um, it kind of depends on what you're looking for in your vehicle. Uh, but there are also ways that lithium can be extracted that aren't uh, harmful to the environment. So there's a really cool setup right now in uh, Imperial Valley, California. Um, there is a, uh, it's a place called Salt and Sea. And so it is a geothermal plant. And, you know, the way geothermal energy works is you're, you're pumping up, um, you know, hot water from deep, deep beneath the earth to spin turbines. And so what, what they're doing is they're extracting some of those, um, some of those salts and some of that briny water. 
and they're finding that there's massive amounts of lithium in it. And so when you operate your geothermal plant, you can actually use um, geothermal energy to extract some of that lithium and separate it out. And so you can use it in a, in a pretty clean way that doesn't have an environmental impact uh, like strip mining would do. So, so yes, lithium can cause some significant environmental uh, impacts, but there are also ways and new technologies that are constantly being developed and pursued that can do it without um, any impact and actually you know, operate just on renewable energy alone. Awesome. And then we have another question from Payman. Um, what is the solution of DOD for EV fires? Since a typical EV fire takes about 2,000 gallons of fire retardant to be extinguished compared to 500 gallons. Yeah, um, so they, they can be, um, they have what's called thermal overload. And so if you get an EV battery going in a vehicle fire, um, they can uh, cause some significant uh, damage that, that takes a lot of water to put out. Um, I will say they are uh, far less common um, than combustion engine fires. And so um, it, it is something that needs to be watched and it, it is a, a fair safety concern. Um, it depends on what chemistry you're using for that battery. So when you're looking at, so right now, you know, about 75% of EVs today are, are lithium iron phosphate or, or, or nickel manganese cobalt. Um, and so they, uh, you know, that, that, is a, that is a fair concern. I will say, as you look at other types of chemistry, so like lithium ion phosphate or sodium ion, they have far less uh, flammable concerns than, than than your typical lithium battery that you would see today. Um, but you know, when you look at car accidents on the road, um, you know there are far more vehicle fires from just combustion engines compared to EVs. Uh, when you look at the statistics, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago on I ninety five. Um, you know, outside of Philadelphia, the the entire highway collapsed um, because there was a fuel fire. So it was a it was a gas um, tanker that erupted in flames and it just burned and burned um, and melted the the overpass that collapsed. And so now you're talking about a major you know I-95 significant corridor for transportation being taken out, um, and that was fossil fuels. So it's not. Um, I think it's fair uh, to say EVs cause that kind of fire concern, but at the same time, you know, it works both ways. All right. So um, I'll kind of pause and ask the, the the talk runners here. Are there any other kind of topics that we want to, I'm looking on, I think we have about 10 or 11 minutes left. So I want to make sure we're talking about um, other stuff too, if we want. So we can talk about, um, uh, we can talk about PFAS exposure. We can talk about burn pits. We can talk about cluster munitions. Um, you know, any, any, any of those topics, we, or we can keep doing Q&A, whatever you guys want. Um, I think whatever, I think if, if you think any of those other topics are important, we'd be happy for you to talk about I, any of them sound great. Um, to us. So it's whatever you want to talk about in the next 10 or 11 minutes is up to you. Okay, I'll, well, maybe we'll try and do like a, a quick speed round. So um, I'll, I'll go. go with, um, we talked about, I know there was a climate change question earlier that I said I would get to, so maybe I'll start there. So um, you know, again, it's not the military's job to solve climate change, but any action that they do can make climate change better or worse because they are a significant driver of energy use and emissions. Um, you know, there was a Reuters piece that came out today that talked about when you combine all the militaries in the world and their energy use, it comes out to about five and a half percent of all greenhouse gas emissions um, a year. So, uh, you know, there is a there is an onus of responsibility there, but the effects of climate change are what the military calls a threat multiplier. So they make, um, you know, those impacts can adversely affect a number of areas, whether that's um, creating more humanitarian crises that the military has to respond to to support. Um, it can exacerbate economic and ecological conditions in places like Africa that can, that can spark further conflict. Um, even here at home, you know, hurricanes and other types of extreme weather have, which are becoming more increasingly occurring, uh, and their severities are becoming more, in, uh, you know, intense, have wrecked military installations. So in 2017, there were three hurricanes that resulted in just, you know, $1.3 billion in damage alone across the U.S. In 2018, there was another $9 billion in damage. Uh, a Category 5 hurricane completely devastated Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. I uh, had impacts in Camp Lejeune. Um, there was Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska that had $500 million of damage um, from flooding. So it's really in DOD's interest to ensure that the planning and design of its facilities when they do military construction takes into account the impact of climate change. And so that's one thing we've pushed 
through Congress is look, not just looking at kind of historical floodplain data, but hey, maybe you should think about you know looking forward and forecasting weather projections and factoring in those into your design standards to make sure you're more resilient um, when when you need to be. Um, we'll, we'll see. I don't know if that answered the climate change question for the guy who had or girl who had what question earlier, but we'll we'll see if they pop back up. Um, let's see. Uh, also, just briefly talk about PFAS chemicals. Um, so the department uses um, firefighting foam, which contains PFAS chemicals. And so we, uh, through Congress, have required them to phase out those effects because there are some really um, harmful effects in terms of uh, carcinogens. They're what's called a bioaccumulant, so they don't break down over time. And so PFAS chemicals are not just in firefighting foam, but there's a lot of everyday stuff that you all interact with. So things like pizza boxes, any kind of grease paper and fast food, um, Glide dental floss, microwave popcorn bags, any clothing with Gore-Tex. Uh, and so the military used that to, or developed uh, the firefighting foam years ago to um, provide a, a significant safety capability. But we're finding out now um, that, you know, it, it will, um, it seeps into groundwater uh, when it's used on an airfield and, and they just sort of spray it around everywhere. It can, it doesn't really go anywhere. You have to care for it and dispose of it very safely. Uh, and so, you know, there are a lot of um, a lot of safety concerns there with PFAS. Um, and then, let's see, what else can we kind of cover? Um, we can talk. Yeah, go, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just want to mention that we had a question. Um, okay. How has the energy efficiency initiatives changed medical slash life saving techniques in the battlefield? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, when you say life saving techniques on the battlefield, are you talking about like medical uh, procedures in, in particular? Or I, I, I don't know that I necessarily see the connection there. No open questions, okay. No, Um. so we had, I just wanted to mention, Ms. Uh, John, we had a person yeah. in the chat ask if you could talk a little bit about cluster munitions because it's been a yeah. topic in the news, if you sure. don't mind touching a little bit on that. Yeah, of course. Um, so cluster munitions uh, really became widespread in the Vietnam War. Um, they produced, uh, you know, instead of a typical artillery shell that impacts, uh, what they do is they kind of shoot a bunch of cluster munitions out the back or out the front. Um, that caused a lot of widespread damage um, over the course of about, you know, three, the size of like three football fields. And so since about World War II, cluster munitions have killed, I mean, between 55,000, 100,000 civilians, uh, wounded thousands more. They've been used in Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Lebanon, the Balkans, Laos. Um, they were used in Iraq um, and over 100 countries have signed treaties promising they won't use them. Um, but a couple obvious um, holdouts in Russia, China, and, and the U.S. have not signed. Um, and so the U.S. military points to the defense of the North Korean or the Korean Peninsula as a big reason behind wanting to use those cluster munitions because they do provide a significant battlefield capability. Um, and so the, the, one of the reasons I think this administration probably decided to send cluster munitions to Ukraine is they are burning through artillery rounds far more than production can keep up with. And so it is a very tough decision. Uh, it is a very complicated decision. Um, you know, NATO allies, uh, there's a meeting going on right now, I think this week, um, about this issue. And so um, DUD has said they will sign a treaty if the technology can get to be about a 1% dud rate, uh, but that technology is not just there yet. So it is um, it is a really tough issue to talk about, but that kind of is the, is the quick summary, if that helps. I don't think we doesn't look like we have any questions. So if there's anything else from your topics that you want to touch on, feel free burn pits or anything else that you'd like to touch on in our last few minutes, you're welcome to. Yeah, sure. Um, so so burn pits, you know, when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and really prior to that, uh, you know, you don't have a, a you know waste disposal system, right? There's no trash deliveries um, or trucks to help you out. So often uh, the military will um, you know, pour jet fuel on stuff and light it on fire. And so obviously that has significant um, toxic and carcinogenic effects for service members who are in proximity to those burn pits, in addition to the people you're around. And so 
it took a long time for the military to kind of phase that out because uh, they viewed it as a operational necessity. And so one of the solutions to that on the technology side is this thing called the uh, Expeditionary Solid Waste Disposal System or ESWDS. And so it is eff effectively a, a shipping container uh, that has a closed burn pit set up inside. So it can burn and operate uh, in a forward operating base. You know, you drive it over with a, with a ship or a truck and set it up. Um, it, it's, it is an entirely closed system. Uh, so it's not putting out those toxic fumes into the environment. And at the same time, it can burn and get rid of the waste, um, whether it's medical waste, food waste, trash, whatever it is uh, that you're using um, over in a forward deployed environment, it can, it can take care of that in a clean and efficient way. So um, ESWDS is, is a new technology that is hopefully gonna be used um, uh, in forward operating bases in the future here. And then we do have another question in the chat from Thomas Harper. Um, could you explain the significance of the dud rate? Yeah, the dud rate. So um, when a cluster munition fires, um, it will shoot out a bunch of what are called bomblets. So uh, basically a bunch of small bombs. And oftentimes, you know, they're designed to explode on impact, um, but a lot of times they don't. And so that's a dud. And so what happens is, you know, fast forward a couple of years when maybe the conflict isn't active anymore, um, civilians move back into an area because it's not an armed conflict zone. Um, you can have, you know, kids who pick them up, they think they're a toy. Uh, you can step on them by accident and not even know they're there. And so that can cause a significant amount of injuries and deaths. And so the dud rate um, or, or the amount of, of bomblets that don't explode is what we're really trying to get after. And so when you can have a 1% dud rate, so let's say there's 100 bomblets and, you know, only one of them duds, um, and then the other 99 operate or explode as, as designed, that's really what, what, they're at, what they're talking about and what they're after. Looks like Tom, I don't- Thomas really... Harper, I think it's, Thomas Harper, by the way, man, I think he's the question MVP. He's asked, I think, more than anybody in, in a good way. Um, yeah. No, Thomas is on our team. Thomas is part, Thomas, oh, okay. is, Thomas is one of our lawyers. That's why. Oh, okay, there That's we go. That's why he's got, got all you. the questions. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. So uh, Gina, do you want to take it away with your closing? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, thank you so much, everybody, um, for being here. And thank you, Mr. Cork, for also being here as well. Sure. We really appreciate it so much. Um, but I just want to let everybody know that tomorrow, Wednesday, July 12th, from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., we will be having another event, and it's called Collaborative Leadership. So if you guys would like to join in on that, you can. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here, and we really appreciate it. So, Thank you. Happy to help.